so I forgot to cover this part. So this is uh, November 22nd. We're still on uh, turbine engine maintenance. We're in the middle of the, we had finished the compressor section yesterday. But the day before yesterday, I made an error. Elizabeth and Amir were kind enough to point that out. When I was talking about EPR, when I was talking about EPR, I got my ratios backwards. So this is actually, they were corrected, is the exhaust over the intake pressure. So I'm going to rewrite it. So it's in your notes from a day and a half ago. So I'm going to cover it again here. EPR stands for engine pressure ratio. And if we take a very large turbofan, And we put a probe in here, and yes, it acts like a pitot tube, and that the pressure in here, if we look at this ratio of engine pressure ratio, pressure total at engine station 7, pressure total at engine station 2, P equals pressure, T equals total, and the 2 or the 7 equals the engine station number. And engine station numbers are places on the engine. It's not like a, a specific number of inches or meters from a certain spot, but the engine manufacturer will say, we're going to call this station number one. So they might just say that the front of the intake is station number one, and just before the first rotating blade is station number two. And at the end of the compressor section is station number three, and at the end of the combustion section is station number four, and on and on and on. So in this case right here, if we put in another pitot tube-like device here, this is station number seven. And this right here, engine station number two. So if I go ahead and finish, i got to put in my big old honking fan. I don't want to forget it this time. And here's, and I'm making this simple. I know that if it's a big old honking turbo fan, we're going to have more than one shaft, more than one spool, two or three for sure, but I'm oversimplifying. So now, as Elizabeth was trying to convince me on uh, day before yesterday, Yes, the pressure inside right here, and remember, this pressure here, you notice it says pressure total. That means it's the ram pressure plus the static pressure. So if we were not running the engine, if the engine was not running, how much air is getting shoved into this probe here, and how much air is getting shoved into this probe there? Anybody? The engine's not running. How much air is getting rammed into it? Zero. So this ratio at, 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 uh, at zero, this ratio would be 14.7 PSI over 14.7. Actually, the, the ram would be zero, zero plus 14.7. Because at zero forward speed or, or at zero RPM, there's no ram. But as soon as we start the engine running, this fan is going to pull air, and of course the engine is going to blow air. So we're going to be having ram into the EPR probe at station number seven, and we're going to have ram air into the EPR probe at station number two. So then I'm just going to make up some numbers. So let's just say at idle, PT7, that's way in the back. Are we blowing air out the tailpipe of a jet engine when it's at idle? Yeah. Yeah, when it's at idle, it's running. If you, if you want air in the combustion chamber burning, you got to let air in the engine. And, of course, if you let air in, you got to let air out. So we're going to have ram plus static. So the static pressure is going to go up, but so is the ram. So we're probably going to end up, and I'm just going to make up numbers, 5 plus 20. And maybe in the intake, we have 2 plus 18. And this part here is ram 
and this part here is static. This probably isn't that high. It's probably just 15 or something. But you'll notice that this number is greater than 1. When the engine is running, So EPR is greater than 1 with engine running. So at idle, it may not be very much. At idle, it might be 1.2. And at takeoff power, it might be 2.3. And I'm making those numbers up. It's going to vary by engine. So literally, what you're going to do as an aircraft mechanic is when you're rigging that engine and trimming that engine to make sure it puts out the right power, you're going to look in a chart and say, okay, this is the pr air pressure we're at based on my altitude above sea level and based on what the weather is today. This is the temperature of the air. So now I can calculate, or the, or the table anyway, knows what the density of the air is. And so now when I push the power lever all the way forward, Here's what EPR, that engine, ought to have to conditions. to you because this is a gauge inside the cockpit that only the pilots use. They push the throttles up on takeoff. They look up this day of pressure, the altitude, 2.2 to get takeoff power. Okay, great. They push it to 2.2. We is make sure and in that day when we push the power lever we get the EPR that the engine manufacturer says we need to be getting one way and it's not can't produce takeoff power then it's going to longer runway than the book and the manufacturer said and they may end up driving off into the runway before they get off the ground and I don't think anybody likes that. Or the pilot will push the throttle forward and they'll, the EPR gauge will go up and it won't get up to the takeoff power setting that's required for that day and the pilot will go we'll have to abort the takeoff and taxi back and then and no flying that day. Well, what the pilot's going to do is on takeoff, they're going to push the power lever forward, and they're going to watch that EPR gauge. And when it gets to the takeoff power setting for that day, then they're going to stop moving the throttle. If they push the throttle forward and the gauge never gets up to takeoff power, they're going to go, I can't get takeoff power. I better not take off. And they're going to pull the throttles back, and they're going to put on the brakes, probably use thrust reverse. They're going to abort the takeoff. So they're not going to get off the ground unless they see the needles show takeoff power. Now what's rather interesting, if you fly in a full authority digital electronic controlled engine, like a 767 or 777, 787, newer 747, 737s, you need to pet the pilots, they just grab the power levers and shove them all the way forward. They don't really, and then they watch the needles come up and see if it comes up to take off power because the computer says, oh, you've pushed the throttles off. Take off. So, the, so the computer pushes the engine gauges here. I'll do it backwards for y'all. The engine gauges will come up. Let's say it's a 200. The EPR needs to be for that day, which the pilots are there. Exactly what you would do if you're trimming the engine, and it had an electronic engine like that. You would push the power levers all the way up and see if the EPR came, I guess you're probably just doing one engine at a time, and see if the EPR came up to what it was supposed to. And then you'd look at the fuel flow, and you'd look at the temperatures in the engine, the exhaust gas temperature in particular, and you'd look up and say, okay, here's the, yeah, I got the EPR under these weather conditions, this temperature, this, this air pressure. Here's the limit. It's got to be cool, no hotter than this on the EGT. So if the limit is 1,000 degrees Celsius on the EGT, and you look at the page and it says 900. You go, Yahoo, we're within limits, and away we go. But if you, but the, the electronic engine control 
it's going to be looking at that EG2. You push the throttles all the way forward, it's going to ramp up the EPR, but when it sees the temperature coming up to 1,000, it'll stop at 1,000 because it's going to try not to hurt the engine. And then, of course, instead of being at 2.2, it's only at 2.0, and you're going to go, oh, it won't develop takeoff power because the engine's too hot. There's no cylinder head temperature heat in turbo engines. The main temperature probe that you're looking at, I'm glad you're asking, on, on jet engines is typically exhaust, gas, temperature. Uh, the aircraft I usually fly doesn't have a cylinder head temperature gauge. You just close your eyes, pilot, and imagine the temperature. Mine's old school, man. It's like 1969. I'm happy I got an oil temperature gauge. So literally, since we're talking about it, I want to keep going on that spot because we're going to wish we're going to end up talking about it anyway. If, we, if, if there was an EGT probe, it's usually more than one probe sticking in just after the turbine section. EGT stands for exhaust. See if I can spell it. Gas temperature. T U R E for some reason. There we go. Exhaust gas temperature. Now you can put exhaust gas temperature probes in more than one location, and every engine manufacturer may put it slightly different. I'm not going to get into the details that I want you to write down at the moment, but I've seen engines, they put the probe right here. And they call it intermediate turbine temperature. Okay, it doesn't matter. It, all that matters is there's a set of temperature probes in the back of the engine after the fuel gets burned. And there's going to be some red line number that cannot be exceeded. And if you're pushing the power, you're trimming the engine, and you push the power lever up, you push the throttle up, and you hit the red line temperature, but you haven't hit takeoff power yet then that means something is wrong. The engine is not operating correctly. And generally, that's when you would go, aha, maybe that's the time we need to do a compressor wash because the engine isn't being as efficient as it used to. Question? Yes, that's a great thought right there. What else could affect it not putting out power? What if a bleed air valve was open and, it, and you were pulling air off of the compressor? Now the engine has to work harder to blow air out the tailpipe because some of that energy is leaving the engine to let cooling air. So, yes, if you had – so, go ahead. When you're trimming the engine, yes, you are trimming for the compressor's efficiency. That's one part of it. Literally, if you're going to fire up an engine, who does it put out that – power it's supposed to? Does it do it within all its parameters, in particular exhaust gas temperature? There's going to be a set of conditions, and it's going to say something like, turn all the bleed air valves off. Don't run the engine anti-ice, which takes bleed air. Don't run the air conditioning system, which takes bleed air. Don't run the leading edge anti-ice system, which takes bleed air off of the engine. There may even be a circuit pull to disengage one main valve on that engine so that valve stays shut. But you brought up a good point. So let's just say you did this and you go, darn, I just did a compressor wash. Operating it, wrote it up that the temperature was too high. That would be a great troubleshooting step. Maybe the feed air valve is stuck open and we just don't know it. So I'm glad you're thinking. That's awesome. All right, so now that I've corrected my mistake and add a little more testable material, yay, we'll continue with combustion section. My hope is to get through uh, the combustion section today and then we'll finish the turbine section in the first 20 minutes on Monday after Thanksgiving, and then the last 30 minutes of Monday's lecture, we'll do a fast review of what we've covered since the previous review, because the test is on what day? 
Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Okay, combustion section. So uh, cleaning, inspection and cleaning. Every so often, the combustion section is going to have to be inspected. If you've done some of the labs in turbines, you've seen the hot section inspection, or HSI. So that is like a fantastic test question. There is, uh, see if I can find a place to do it. Da -da -da. HSI equals hot section inspection. And it's very common. Let's see. Well, let's think about it for a second. Anybody except Elizabeth and Amir, because obviously they know more about jet engines than I do. Well, obviously, at one point in our lives, you guys knew more than me. Hot section inspection. Which do you think inside of the engine is, sub is subjected to more stress, more strain? The hot section or the cold section of a jet engine? Okay, both. Votes per cold. Who votes for hot? Okay, there. Has anybody ever seen something like it? Tony Curtis, Marilyn Monroe. It's black and white, but it's really good. Okay, fine. You don't have to watch that. The hot section definitely is more bad things happening. So generally speaking, if you're talking, let's say you have a jet engine, and let's say it's 10,000 hours to it's not probably not going to be 10,000 hours till you have to do hot inspection every 300 hours. So when it gets to 3,300, you have to do hot section inspection apart and, and inspect the combustion section and the turbines. If you fix anything that's wrong, you put it all back on another 30 hours, and then you do another inspection. So you don't have to write this down. Well, actually, it would be great to write do hot inspections more often than you're going to do cold section inspections. So those are done more often than cold section inspections. I think on PT6s generally, they're like a 6,000 hour between overhaul. But when you hit 3,000, you got to do a hot section inspection. Take it apart, inspect it, fix everything that's wrong, put it back together again. You then get to go another 3,000 hours. So in that case, you're, you're inspecting the hot section every 3,000 hours, but you're only inspecting the cold section every 6,000 hours. What? That's a lot of hours. But let's take a piston-powered uh, airplane engine. Let's say it's a four-cylinder Lycoming or four-cylinder Continental. Generally, if they're normally aspirated, that is no supercharger, no turbocharger. It's just whatever air it can suck in. It doesn't have an air pump on it. Most of those time between overhauls recommended by the manufacturer are around 2,000 hours. But if the aircraft's not operated for a Part 130, an airline, or an air taxi, you know, it's not mandatory to overhaul the engine. You can go past the manufacturer's recommended overhaul. You can have a whip. We won't talk today about how good and how bad it is to go past that. But think about crap. I'm going to say that again. Think about all that crap that's inside of a reciprocating engine. Where oil from the engine gets into the combustion section, and some of it gets burnt, and some of it by things back in the oil. piston engine oil get pretty dirty. And in fact, if you don't have an oil filter on your airplane engine or helicopter engine, how often do you think of oil? If you, had, if you had engine oil, hey, Nathan, you, this is your last semester. How often, you have to change the engine, how often do you need to change engine oil in a reciprocating engine aircraft uh, if it does not have an oil filter installed? Anybody want to help Nathan out? No, without an oil filter is a trick question. Say again. You got the first digit right. What's the second digit? Yeah, it's 25. Yeah, so generally speaking, 25. If you do have oil filter installed, most of the manufacturers recommend you change the engine and the oil filter. How often? 
every 50 hours. Now, what happens if you've ever, anybody ever checked the oil in your car? Remain seated if you've ever done that. Okay, good. So you'll notice if you check the oil right after the oil changed, kind of as you get closer towards that 3,000, that 5,000 miles, you keep pulling the stick out once a week to see if there's oil in the engine, and it gets darker and darker and darker till it Most of that crud is from the combustion chamber getting uh, contaminants getting into the engine. Well, it's worse in airplane engines because airplane engines, they're more... More contaminants get into the engine while they're reciprocating in aircraft engines than do in cars by far. Every diesels you need to change oil every fill up? Okay. Oh, okay. So let's talk about jet engines because that's why we're here today. Jet engine oil, how much of that oil gets pumped into the combustion chamber, scraped off, and put back in the oil? What's that, John? What's, what's that symbol? Yeah, in some countries that's like the that's like the finger, but that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, look it up. Look it up. Uh, uh, hand signals in different countries that mean it's a it's a well, well, right. So in foreign countries just and and and, and yeah. In any case, yeah, I, I did a few. Point fingers at people. In your, if you're in Great Britain and you're driving, you screw up and you're sorry, you put your hand up and sorry in Great Britain. And to do that every day. You ever try to side out of the road for, for 2,400 miles in a three week period? I only drove on the wrong. Or it would have been worse than that, but my wife was telling me to get, up, get back on it. Didn't hit anybody. I didn't hit it. I, I, I hit a curb. I was, the curb was on the wrong side of the car. For some reason, it was over on the left, and I parked, and the curb was on the right. And they, it was, and the car had gone down. It's tire. Only damage I did on rental cars for 2,400 miles. I was very happy. It was 100 bucks for another tire. I'm digressing. So turbine engine oil. My apologies. Turbine engine oil. John says that zero amount of the oil gets thrown into the combustion section and scraped off and pushed back down into the oil. Does anybody agree with him? Have you had engine oil systems for turbines yet? No one wants to say, okay, that's all right, I don't mind. All right, that, John is correct in that in theory, oil in a turbine engine ever gets inside of anywhere the fuel's getting burned, or gets inside anywhere the air. Never. Unless there's a seal failure or something. In theory, none of that oil ever gets into the engine. So the oil, turbine engine oil lasts a long, long time. What do you think is happening to the bearings inside the engine? The part where it rubs and it spins on the inside of the engine? Of a reciprocating engine, is there stuff in there besides the oil? Yeah, all those contaminants that came from the combustion section. So is that oil going to do as good a job? No, it's not. So the bearings inside the engine are going to wear out faster. And engine bearings for 6,000 hours, on the turbine end, the oil doesn't get contaminated. Don't go back metal coming off of them and bearing out. Then they could go 6,000 hours very easily. Is anybody, there's a, can anybody tell me where has the, a turbine engine operated for the longest without being shut down? I can tell you where it was in an aircraft. In the 1950s, there was three B-52 bombers that took off in the United States, and the three of them flew around the world, and they did air refueling for 2,400 miles. It took, they flew for 48 hours, a little over 48 hours before they landed. I think that probably topped off the oil level. 
but they ran the engines for 48 hours without shutting them off. Can anybody think of a circumstance where turbine engines have operated for longer than 48 hours? Pardon me? A ground power unit? To, what kind of a ground power unit? A generator. Uh, yes, I think there was probably a generator that has more than 48 hours. I bet you that's true. In the United States, one way to through pipelines is to have giant turbo shaft engines. And when I say giant, I'm talking about an intake that's five feet in diameter. It's like a 747 engine, except it doesn't have a fan. It drives a shaft, and that shaft spins a, an air pump. It's not really air. It's a natural gas pump. And they will run those engines off of the natural gas pipeline that it's pumping, and they will have three engines in the building, and they will run two of them there. And they'll, do, they'll have one shut down, and they'll do maintenance on it, and it's ready as a hot spare. If one of the engines has to get shut down, fire up the third one, shut down another maintenance. They pretty much always have two running, but they will start the engine up and run it for a couple of months without shutting it down. They'll run it for a couple of months. I have a feeling that they go out there and check the oil, just in case. Yeah, geothermal turbines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, got, I, I want to keep going here because somebody wants to cook, hot, cook hamburgers today. So a combustion section. Here we go again. get my ready to go. So combustion section. Let's see. Service life. Can anybody tell me what service life means? Yeah, how long it will last. Yeah, how long it'll last yeah. While while running. Yeah, it's not how long it's sitting on a shelf. Let's see. Dun, dun, dun. So, external. So, if we're looking at an external combustion case, then we can look for hot spots, exhaust leaks, and distortions. So there's the three basic things you can look at on the external engine case. Hot spots, exhaust leaks, and distortions. I kind of start charging Brian a dollar every time he takes a picture. All right. So let's just not worry about which stages they are, but if we're looking at a combustion section in particular, what are we inspecting for? We're looking for cracks. We're looking for warping. We're looking for damage due to foreign objects. Let's see. We already got cracks, so we're also going to look for burning, and we're going to look for buckling. So that's one, two, three, four, five basic things if we're looking inside of a combustion section. Looking for cracks, warping, foreign object damage, burn, buckling. And to make Elizabeth happy, the test question will go like this. Name six of the five basic things you're looking for when inspecting a combustion section. All right, you got to now. We're talking about cleaning or degreasing. Now you got to be careful because chlorinated solvents are corrosive to stainless steel. So what does that mean? Does that mean only clean with maintenance manual approved cleaners? It will go cleaning fluids. What else could you make a combustion liner out of other than stainless steel? Anybody except John? Because I think he knows the answer. You're not John. Go ahead. Ah, titanium. Okay. The question was other than stainless steel. 
Other than stainless steel, what could you make it out of? Well, some other kind of stainless steel. No, that, that would not get you any credit on the test whatsoever, just so you're clear. Yeah, so you're generally going to find you're going generally going to find combustion sections made out of of stainless steel or titanium based. Well, it could also be nickel steels. Um, all right. So, let's see. Dun, 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 dun. If what we're just going to say if you're done cleaning a combustion section and you don't know how long it's going to sit on the shelf, you're generally going to coat it with a com corrosion preventative solution. Something that when on the engine, it won't. I had a story, but I got to keep going. I only got 13 more minutes. Da -da 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 -da. And it's pretty obvious you'll have to take it apart however somebody says. So we're going to watch a very short portion of a boroscope and training video. When an APU is louder than normal or makes unusual noises, it is usually caused by damage on the APU compressor and color blades. With a flexible boroscope, you can do an internal inspection to verify damage to the load compressor or power section before removing an APU. So boroscoping, first off, it's a visual inspection and it lets you gain access to areas of the engine that you would not normally be able to see. But with the bore scope, so you can that's go the part you got to write down right there. Whoops. Assembly is that a boroscope inspection, B O R E, well, there it's spelled right there, B O R E S C O P E. Bore, it's, well, if you said it the way it's spelled, it'd be bore scope, B O R E. SCOPE is an inspection that can be done, that can usually be done without taking the engine apart. You literally stick a little tiny camera on the end of a tube and you open up a hole or a plug on the side of the engine and you put it in the engine and if you want to inspect blades you can spin the engine around. Now granted it's not as good for inspecting the stationary blades because it's hard to get it and look at all the stationary blades but it's really good for looking at the rotating blades. Which blades do you think get banged up the most? The stationary blades or the rotating blades? The rotating blades. If you're in the turbine section, which blades are subjected to centrifugal force more? Rotating blades or the stationary blades? Hopefully this is not a trick question. Which ones are exposed to vast, way more force? The move the blades that spin around the rotating blades. So which ones are going to have to are more critical? The rotating blades. So that's great that you can do boroscopes without having to take the engine apart. In fact, you probably don't even have to take it off of the aircraft. And it lets you gain access to areas of the engine that you would not normally be able to see. But with the boroscope, you can go right to that location and do a comprehensive visual inspection. In this video, we're going to review the borescope procedure for the 331-500 APU on the Boeing 777. First, you'll inspect the load compressor. Then, you'll inspect the first stage compressor. Oh, the first stage... To make sure... So your first inspection area is going to be the two impellers that are off of the inlet. You can insert the borescope through the load compressor borescope port or you can open the IGV vanes and go through the plenum access doors. If you go through the panel that you remove you'll get a better picture. You'll get more area that you can inspect as opposed to going through the borescope dedicated port that lets you see the exit into the diffuser. Make sure that the tip of the borescope is clear of the impeller blades. Know where your engine is when you are rotating so you don't take the tip off of the borescope by rotating it.
Yeah, if you broke the tip off, now you got to take the engine apart. Adjust the borescope as necessary to see the load compressor. Slowly turn the shaft counterclockwise and examine the load compressor thoroughly for corrosion or foreign object damage. <laughs> yeah, if you see if you see this, where was that? Corrosion or foreign object damage. Federal FAR 43.11 subparagraph B says if you see damage this bad, you must, as the aircraft mechanic, make a verbal expression such as ah. And then you have to write up the discrepancy. <laughs> It'll buff up. Ooh, there's a nice bend. Oh! Yeah, these are cutaways. Again, I want to see what, it, what the boroscope The blade on the impeller. And then follow it down towards the, the, the tip, blade tip so that you ensure better coverage on your inspection. Yeah, we're just going to get rid of the sound because I don't like it. There we go. It takes a lot of practice to, to do this. There we go. Y'all need to start practicing. Are we already odd at that one? Okay, I think that's enough boroscope inspections. So the nice thing about a boroscope is that you can uh, inspect some of the, the rotating blade. You can inspect the rotating blades pretty easily, even though you haven't had to take the engine apart and you haven't don't have to take the engine off of the aircraft. Generally speaking, boroscope inspections are done when you think something is wrong when you think something is wrong so there that's the second thing you could write down about boroscope inspections Because usually if it's a typical inspection, you know, a scheduled inspection, you're taking the engine apart anyway, and you can see it better without, uh, without using a boroscope. All right, so let's see. If you're taking the engine apart, so this is really talking about disassembly. How many S's are in disassembly? Did I spell it right? Are there two? Are there is that is that too many S's right there? I think it's I think Elizabeth is right. I think there's just one S. Disassembly. So you need to make sure you support the engine and you need to make sure you support the parts. In fact, there's this really fun video right here. I'm gonna show you just about one minute on it. I'm gonna leave the sound off. And so this is a turbine and a power plant. Uh, see, we need to find out how big this thing is. Let's see. There's got to be somebody in one of these pictures. There we go. So how big is this thing? So just so you know, no one was hurt in this incident. So look how big it is. The diameter is like more than 6 or 8 or 10 feet. I'll just watch. Uh-oh. Yeah, crunchy, crunchy. Here, let's watch it again. No one was hurt. He was out of the way. Oh, I don't know, millions, millions, millions of dollars. And this guy, that guy right there, he's like going, he's, you know, I think, I think, I think he's also going, he's also going, he's also going, ah! That's also a mandatory. That's not in the FARs to scream if you almost die. You do not have to scream if you almost die. All right. So this one, we've seen this one, aligning the components. We've seen this one before. If you're taking, like, taking the engine in and out of the aircraft, 
You don't want to damage anything. So same thing when you're disassembling an engine. You don't want to damage. You don't want to damage the engine when you're taking it apart. And of course, here uh, we need to keep the area clean. We already covered this one. I already talked about that one. And temporary marking. Guess what? If you're going to mark the engine up while you're taking it apart to make it easier to put back together again, make sure you mark it using something the manufacturer says is okay. Generally speaking, what is the worst thing you could use to mark an engine? Yeah, pencil leads because it's graphite carbon and it tends to have heat concentrated on it. Let's see. So we can go over this list, but you'll notice, let's see. Limits and, and one of the things that you know we're not going to do is try to say here's how you're going to inspect every single engine. So it really, really depends on every single engine. I can go through all these parts and it's going to be different for the engine that you're working on. Where can you have a little tiny crack? Where can you have no cracks? Generally speaking, can you have cracks on the rotating blades? Yes or no? No. Okay. Generally speaking, might you be able to have cracks somewhere else if they're small enough? The answer is Yes, manufacturer's maintenance manual says it is. But that's generally on parts that don't spin and parts that are not blades. Even stationary blades, generally you can't have cracks in them. So we've already talked about cracks. So this is all kinds of cracks. All right, fuel nozzles. If you're going to inspect them, you're going to end up having to clean them. And of course, you're going to use cleaning fluid that's approved by the manufacturer. Generally speaking, you don't use a wire brush. Does anybody know why you generally don't use metal wire brushes on fuel nozzles? What's that? Well, they could embed the metal of the brush into the component. That's certainly true. What's another reason not to clean the nozzles with a metal brush? You could damage it. And more and interestingly enough, you could actually, those little orifices, the little tiny holes, they're the exact right size. You don't want to use metal to clean them and then make the holes too big. So non-metal brushes and the correct cleaning fluid are the way you clean fuel nozzles. You generally do not use metal cleaning brushes on fuel nozzles. And then I personally like this. I went and looked at it. Mr. Asman told me to show this. He gave me this one. And it's that, uh, it's that jet engine guy that, that's uh, a hack. No, this is just an advertisement. That's the ugliest librarian I ever saw. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to make a derogatory comment based on someone being a librarian. There it is. There it is. So he's got a chamber, and he's running high-pressure water through a fuel, fuel nozzle so he can look at the spray pattern and make sure that it's not messed up. So if you were going this would be one portion of an inspection on a fuel nozzle is correct spray pattern. So you may not have this thing in your shop. There may be a certain pressure you need to run through it. Fuel pressures in jet engines, especially the bigger engines, the fuel pressure is really, really high because the air pressure inside of the combustion chamber is really, really high. So you got to really have high pressure. So you might have to send the nozzle out and that's okay. So you're going to see I get it right here. Hey, it's practically perfect time. So you're going to make sure that you check the flow pattern on your fuel nozzle. Does anybody have any questions about combustion section inspections? Okay, go barbecue.